I will. Um, I will um, Okay. I'm going to take my face out so I can eat my dinner. Sorry. Okay. okay. And so I do have, so we have, we're very fortunate to have Becky Stone with us tonight. Uh, and then we have two more to go. March 23rd, we'll hear from Joey Medea and then Larry Bounds will talk about Houdini on April 27th. So still a lot more book talks to come. But tonight we get to hear about a different kind of action hero, because our, our theme is history's real action heroes. Mm -hmm. And we tried to pick different types of action. And most definitely what we hear tonight, and if you are lucky enough to make it to Ashland in July to hear Becky's performance, uh, you will see it embodied is um, action, not as a pilot and not as an explorer um, and not as a magician, but action that is touching people's lives and making real change. So I'm really excited uh, to have Becky Stone with us tonight and have her talk about uh, Polly Murray and about the book Proud Shoes. So I will turn things over to you, Becky. Oh, thank you, Delisa. It's my pleasure to be here. And it was my pleasure to reread Proud Shoes, um, I, I don't know, just a, a few weeks ago. Um, it is my favorite of the books that I've read by Polly Murray. I first did her in 2003. Ooh, so that makes it 20 years ago. Okay. And um, a lot more information has come out on her. The, and uh, some other books have been published and some more of her papers and sermons have been published. Um, but uh, Proud Shoes and her autobiography were the first books that I read about her. Um, for those of you who, who may not know, Polly Murray was born in 1910, and she died in 1985, and she was a, a brilliant woman. Um, she became an attorney, a civil rights activist, a feminist, and eventually the last seven years of her life, she was an Episcopal priest. And um, it's hard to tell all of her story in a presentation and, and it's hard to tell all of her story even in a book. Some of these books are, are mighty long and thick, but she wanted to tell the story of her family in Proud Shoes. Um, I, I feel as though it's the title is Proud Shoes, subtitled The Story of an American Family. And it is indeed an American family. Um, it, it's the kind of family that really could only exist here in this country. We uh, tout ourselves as a melting pot and truly the experience of African-Americans in this country is uh, one of a melting pot. Uh, there, and it's, our story is a unique story because of all the great uh, nationalities and religions and colors of people who have come to make America there is no other group of people that has the experience of slavery as part of their history. And um, in this book, Proud Shoes, shares some of what that experience is. Now, Polly Murray was born in 1910 and grew up in uh, Jim Crow, America. That's when the laws, um, well, well, there were just race laws. And by law, you black people were, were very uh, limited in what they could enjoy of their American citizenship. And um, that was her 
experience growing up in Durham, North Carolina. And for the most of her life, she was fighting against Jim Crow. And she just wanted to put that behind her. She said she would never live in the South again. She finished high school, went North and stayed away except for visiting family occasionally. Um, when she was three years old, her mother died. Pauli was three, the youngest of six children. They were living in Baltimore, Maryland. Her father was an educator and her mother was a nurse. And um, as Pauli remembers the situation and tells us in her autobiography, at the age of three, with her mother having just died, she was given the choice of either staying in Baltimore with her father and his family uh, and her siblings, or she could choose to go with her mother's family without her siblings to Durham, North Carolina. And Polly chose to go to Durham. And so Proud Shoes is about her, her mother's family. When Polly was three years old, she went into a household of four adults, two of whom were elderly. Uh, and that alone is a, a trying thing to think of for her, poor little Polly, as well as her grandparents. Um, they did not make too many adjustments to having a, a three-year-old in the family. They made her adjust to life there in the what was rural or semi-rural uh, South. And um, this book, Proud Shoes, starts there when Polly is a preschooler and living in a black neighborhood that uh, was really a pretty poor neighborhood in Durham, North Carolina, living with her aunts and her grandparents. And it's starting there, that first chapter of, um, of Proud Shoes is worth reading if you don't bother to read the rest of the book. Uh, the portrait of life there is full of life and vitality and the characters are wild. It's cinematic in how it describes the area and people's lives intersecting and, and interacting. There's all this Southern um, and Southern African American uh, dialogue and phrases and idioms. It's, it's fun. And her grandmother is quite the character, as is her, her husband, her, uh, Polly's grandfather. Um, and from there, the book moves back into history, uh, explaining um, how her, her grandfather, from a very diff different background from his, his wife, her grandfather comes from, um, was born free. He was a free black man. Um, and his father had married a white woman and they were farmers and business people uh, in south of Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, near in Chester County. You may not know where that is, but it's close to Maryland and, and Delaware. And he, he served in the Civil War and came south and met Cornelia, who was born a slave. However, she was very mixed. Her mother was a mulatto and her father was his, her mother's white slave owner. So, uh, and Cornelia most, you know, unusually was um, recognized as a slave However, she was raised in the master's house as um, the, the church, the Episcopal church they attended described her as um, one of the servant 
children of a very prominent family in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the Smiths, who uh, were politicians and attorneys and big landowners and supporters and helping to found the uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, so Cornelia kind of grew up in this odd world of being enslaved, but being um, a part of the slave owner's household and the favorite of her of that family. There were four servant children, enslaved children of the um, Smith brothers, but um, her father, Sidney, had only fathered one of those four children, Cornelia, and he loved Cornelia. And when he be, uh, was not able to take care of his children anymore um, or his child anymore, his sister, Mary Ruffin Smith, raised them in the household, uh, provided for them in her will. Um, so two very different families, a part of Polly Murray's family that she writes about in Proud Shoes, a chapter or so about her grandfather and his family. And then we move in into Durham, North Carolina and read a chapter or so about Cornelia and back and forth until the, the story comes full circle and um, Paul, Pauli Murray uh, tells us about her grandfather's death in 1919. And her narrator's voice always is, is always has that distance of remembering these are, are memories of that have been carefully researched. Polly Murray um, is an exacting uh, person in terms of detail and uh, wanting concrete answers and documentation for everything. And, um, and she does that throughout this book. I learn a lot of history rereading this. Um, you know, I do Harriet Tubman and, um, and talk about uh, the Underground Railroad and Harriet made her escape through Maryland into Delaware, uh, mm -hmm. primarily uh, going through Thomas Garrett's home in Wilmington, Delaware. And he was an, an abolitionist and and actually, after all the reading I've done about Harriet Tubman, the most I've learned about Thomas Garrett was what Pauli Murray wrote in Proud Shoes. So you get a, a clear picture of what um, slavery was like um, in, in Durham and in what the confusion there is about slave and free living together uh, in Wilmington and uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where Polly lived, you know, un until she was three years old. But it it covers, um, you know, slavery, Civil War, uh, the um, Reconstruction, on up through 1919, with thoroughly and and well researched uh, by Pauline. And, and that's kind of where my, my criticism of the, the book comes. Um, you know, Polly spent her entire life writing this book. Uh, she wrote it originally a short story. She attended Hunter College. She accomplished her mission of attending an integrated school in the North, away from the Jim Crow South. And she was able to go to Hunter College and she majored in creative writing. Um, and that's what she wanted to be, was a poet. She ended up writing some poetry, writing uh, proud shoes uh, and doing a lot of political and, and persuasive writing. But um, she wrote basically the first chapter, that colorful chapter of Proud Shoes 
for her um, as an English assignment at Hunter College. Uh, she changed the name of the characters as opposed to it's being Polly. Uh, she renamed herself Benny and, uh, and wrote about her grandparents. Um, and so her teacher saw something special about that story and, um, and saw the gift that Polly had for words and, and for writing. And she encouraged Polly to um, continue the story, to, to write more and flesh it out. Um, Polly, had, her mentor was the poet Stephen Vincent Benet. And one day, rather than sharing her poetry with him, she shared that story. And he was really excited by it. And he wanted her to continue to work on it and expand it into a novel. She shared it with a professor. Polly attended Howard Law School, but her, her close friend um, uh, was a professor of, uh, at the undergraduate level at Howard, Caroline Ware. And she shared this short story with Caroline Ware who loved it and sent it to her friend who was a professor of English at Vassar College. She loved it. Everyone wanted her to, they wanted more. They wanted more about this family and in the style in which that first chapter is written. Um, she had all kinds of mentors, of course, an editor at the publishing house and uh, her agent, uh, whoever read that first chapter and the subsequent chapters wanted her to work on it. She was able to go to the McDowell Colony, which is up in New Hampshire for, for artists so that they can have a quiet, peaceful place to focus on their art and not have to worry about supporting themselves. Um, she was one of the first ones there with James Baldwin. Um, everywhere she was encouraged to pursue writing about her family. But the criticism that many people made was that um, it kind of got bogged down in the research. The rest of the book still has these fabulous characters and really interesting stories, but the style is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's more academic than that first chapter. Uh, not that the stories aren't just as fascinating and insightful um, and painting a, a picture of black society through all the, through those decades, um, but it's not quite as lively or as, as much fun. Um, I really appreciated the book because I could identify with so much of that experience of being, of having other races in your heritage and uh, wanting to, to serve the race and um, strive and get an education and the value of education and, uh, you know, the kind of classism and racism that actually exists within uh, our African-American society. And Polly explores all of that. Um, and she shares, it's so personal, she shares a lot of her confusion about her race, uh, her own family, but race in America and her identity. And um, that's not, it's not shared in Proud Shoes or in her autobiography, but um, there, she had a lot of gender uh, confusion as well. And so in some ways, you know, I'm not a writer nor a, and a historian, but in some ways when I read, uh, I'm a, a theater person. So when I read a play or a poem or a short story it, and, and I'm going to direct or perform in a show, I want to know who is it for? Who am I writing for? Who am I trying to speak to? Who do I want to pull into this story? And when I think about Proud Shoes, or even her autobiography. 
I feel as though the, the process, the mo most important process for her is personal and that she's sorting through issues that she's had trouble dealing with uh, in her life. So, um, you know, in that sense, I, I feel it just falls a little short of uh, success. But in the sense of getting some insight into what the Black American experience has been, um, I, I think it's a really fun and powerful book. You, you just grow to love these people. You just grow to love them. So I don't know, um, I, and I've forgotten, uh, this lady's name, was it Ruth, has told me she had made her way through part of uh, Pauli's autobiography, which was the first book that I read about her. And, and uh, it's filled with details. Pauli was kind of compulsive about keeping all of her correspondence, everything, copies of everything she wrote to other people, all of her papers, um, and all the correspondence that she received, as well as, you know, documents, uh, that things that documented her family and her own life. And in her autobiography, it's just filled with it. When I first read this and thought, I'm going to portray this woman, there's no way that I can keep straight all of the names and all of the experiences. Um, but it's, it's fun to um, explore. She, she knew a lot of key people. And, um, and so you will find out what her accomplishments were in this autobiography, uh, which is published under two titles. Pauli Murray, the autobiography of a black activist, feminist, lawyer, priest, and poet. And, or the other title is Song in a Weary Throat, which I think is, um, and that was her first title. Um, and I, I think uh, that reveals her, her creative writing, her poetry self, her soul. Um, and, uh, but Proud Shoes is, is a different experience. So I do, I do recommend reading Proud Shoes before you read her, her autobiography, and then it will flesh out her autobiography in ways that, um, you know, that the writing in the autobiography just that it doesn't do it. So I, I don't know if anyone else has uh, read about Polly Murray or any of her works or poetry. Her sermons have been published um, and then there are books about her. But if you, I'm eager to hear any comments or questions you might have. And feel free to put questions in the chat um, or if you would like to, um, you have reaction buttons where you could raise your hand um, or you could just unmute. Um, uh, Dorothy Stratton, uh, our amazing committee member uh, who writes, reads all the books thoroughly and writes the press releases, um, always sends some questions to Prime the Pump. So I'm just going to pick uh, one of those. And boy, there's so many ways to talk about what you just set up. Um, but I think the one I want to start with is um, Dorothy wrote, can you talk more about post-Civil War efforts to bring education to formerly enslaved persons, both adults and children? Were states required to do anything, or did it all depend on individuals like Robert Fitzgerald or Black churches or Black civic organizations? Maybe that's one way to start into this is talking about, you know, efforts to move out of uh, and educate. Yeah. Well, the, the federal government certainly made an effort to help everyone with the Freedmen's Bureau, to help formerly enslaved people. And, um, but it, it, those efforts to put money into education and uh, land ownership or, or, you know, they were not enforced in the South. And 
the Freedmen's Bureau, Congress ended funding for it and staffing it in, 19, in 19, 1875. So it did not last a, a long time. Um, there were efforts to educate formerly enslaved people. If, if you try to, to educate people who were enslaved in the South, you were literally risking your life, certainly your livelihood and putting your family at risk. But um, there were efforts made by uh, missionaries um, and, you know, freed Blacks trying to, to have homeschooling, basically, in secret to teach enslaved people how to read and write. Uh, when it was something that was so consistently denied Black people, um, you know, it was seen as a, a tool of freedom it, that it empowered you as a free person. So there were tons of churches, especially after the Civil War, there were tons of uh, missionary churches and Robert um, Fitzgerald, Pauli Murray's grandfather, uh, came south and worked for Quaker, Presbyterian, Lutheran uh, groups had schooling for Blacks in the South. Um, they, they were in some ways better uh, run and supplied by the the missions than they were by any public ed education when that finally started to happen in the late 1890s. Um, and, you know, I, you, you go on into the, uh, through the 1890s into the 1900s and uh, there were the Julius Rosenwald schools, uh, which he established in partnership with Booker T. Washington. Um, be, over 6,000 of those schools were schools for Negroes in the South that uh, were, had to be uh, built. Julius Rosenwald is a, a philanthropist who was um, half owner you know, his name is not in Sears and Roebuck, but he was connected and his wealth was from Sears and Roebuck. And he established um, a lot of uh, philanthropies to help educate Negroes. Pauli Murray herself was the winner of a Rosenwald Fellowship when she finished um, Howard Law School. But the Rosenwald schools uh, were established in black communities where they provided half of the funding and could and built the buildings and Rosenwald provided uh, half the other the rest of the funding and the design for how to build the buildings. So it was all through private efforts like that uh, that brought education to enslaved or formerly enslaved people. Um, the federal laws may have been there, uh, but they were not enforced. They, they were just not enforced. And it's still a, a problem um, in, in the South, even where I live, the, the inequality of the education in black communities and white com as opposed to white communities. Um, Becky, um, Larry Bounds asked a question about you as a portraying Polly. What are the most common questions you get from the audience when you portray her? The almost every time I get the question of why don't I know about her or why didn't I know about her? And, um, you know, I... Having done her for a long time and uh, just, I, I suspected as, you know, in her early writing, she did not talk about uh, being a homosexual and thinking of herself as a, a boy. 
Um, but she lived as best as she could as a lesbian. And I think that's the reason people don't know about her, that she had to keep so much of her life under wraps. Um, she talks in her autobiography about opportunities to, uh, you know, fill positions at the state level or in the federal government. And while she was young and, um, you know, political and a part of, you know, trying to change America in her 20s, in the 1920s and 30s in New York City, um, she had some communist affiliations and, um, and that kind of thing she, she knew would keep her from advancing in the political or, or uh, working in, in the government in, in America. So the, those two personal things, I think, uh, kept her from, you know, taking a more public uh, view, uh, a more public stance. Uh, she was definitely recognized by other civil rights attorneys and other feminist attorneys in her career. She was consulted by almost everyone, but um, she did, did not uh, have any public leadership roles in the civil rights movement or the feminist movement. I'm gonna throw in a follow-up question from me on that. So you said she was meticulous in keeping records and notes and documentation of things, but was that true for these two very personal issues or did, did she document those? Cause that even in, even in a diary at the time that could have been risky. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I think that m most of the information that has now become public about that has come from, uh, you know, hints and in, in intimations in um, her correspondence and stories from people who, who knew her and photographs. There are just tons of photographs where she's um, dressed like a boy. Um, and her aunt Pauline, her namesake, uh, her, who raised her, called her my little girl boy. And she let her dress as a boy as she was growing up. Uh, except for going to church. You had to wear a dress and gloves and hats and the whole nine yards. But um, the rest of the time, uh, Polly just wore little boy clothing and they would go out shopping and Polly would try on boy clothes and that's what they went home with. Um, Ruth asks, have you seen the movie on Amazon called My Name is Polly Murray? Yes, yes, I did see it. And uh, they're the same women who put together RBG, uh, which about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which was a very successful documentary. I, I, I was impressed with everything that I saw in that documentary, and I felt it was, was accurate. Um, I just didn't think it was as good as RBG in terms of my <laughs> feelings about film. But uh, Yes, I as soon as I could, I streamed it or whatever I had to do to get it on TV. And um, it's good. It's good. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sorry, I don't know where the Q&A button is, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I saw, in, yeah, I saw I, I heard the two women who did it um, talking about it. And they said it was so easy for them. They were because Paulie Murray kept records of everything. You know, they yes. were, she made videos of herself. Back. Oh, I, I, I wasn't aware that she, she had made videos of yeah. herself. So if there's video, I haven't seen the movie, but if there's like some videos, they, they are like her original videos that she Oh, made. okay. And that was really valuable to me to get to hear her voice and how she carried herself and, um, and what she sounded like, uh, you know, and so I was... That was one of the reasons I jumped on seeing the documentary as, as uh, fast as I could, you know, to get a sense of who she was. It was very hard for me to do her in 2003 based on her uh, 
I read her poetry, Dark Testament, mm -hmm. uh, this autobiography, Proud Shoes, and a collection of her sermons. And uh, from all of that, even as, as much as you get in proud shoes of, of what she was like, I still didn't have a sense of how to do her. I, I think she's much better now. You know, I have matured as a Chautauquan and, um, and there's, there was just so much more available and I have a better sense of, um, of how she carried herself. I, I feel very fortunate. I got to do Polly Murray last summer and, uh, and it was taped at the Greenville Chautauqua. And for some reason, Polly Murray's niece uh, so wanted to see it. And uh, Greenville Chautauqua made that possible. And she was very pleased. She didn't say anything about, oh, you were just like Aunt Polly or anything like that. But she was very pleased with how I portrayed her. And um, I don't think she would have been very pleased with a tape of 2003. I, I just have a better sense of who that woman was and uh, always respected her, but I, I, I need to have a feeling for each character. So. Just as a side note, um, books are being mentioned and a video is being mentioned. So we will, when we send a follow-up email tomorrow, we will include those. So don't worry if you are not getting everything written down. Uh, I'm making notes and, and Star and I will uh, tag team and make sure you get that information. So not only Proud Shoes, but all these other things you can look at too. Um, mm -hmm. Keep putting questions in the chat. I'm going to, I'm Dorothy has some questions that are really more about um, the the family life and the history that Proud Shoes comes out. So let me just um, go back to the first thing she sent um, where she said, I know Marilyn remained in the union, mm -hmm. but had many Confederate sympathizers. Can you describe more about activities and attitudes close to the Mason-Dixon line separating Pennsylvania and Maryland just before and during the Civil War? Okay. I can say that it was confusing. The two books that I read about Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman was born and raised on the eastern shore of Maryland, and she only ran uh, the Underground Railroad from Maryland into, well, to Philadelphia, and then she had to go all the way to Canada. And the two books uh, by Kate Larson and Catherine Clinton uh, spend a lot of time describing what life was like in Maryland during slavery. And, um, I, I, I just I would read those sections and put the book down and think, how do you sort out relationships in a society where there are free Blacks and enslaved Blacks? There are um, abolitionists who uh, are, are not necessarily uh, not racist. I mean, many abolitionists were people who thought, thought that owning other human beings was a bad thing, but that uh, Black people were inferior human beings. Um, where your economy, it, it depends on the labor of enslaved people. So that, uh, you know, if your neighbor has a different opinion, that's fine, but you dare not mess with my property. Uh, where white people were, you know, intermarrying all of these families to, act, to pull land together. And uh, slaves were allowed to, um, to go visit their families on nearby plantations, which is a, a result of slaves being the property of all these families that were intermarrying. Um, it was not unusual to have um, slaves, especially men, run away for 
for what I would describe as a break from slavery. They would run into the swamps, and this is the eastern shore of Maryland. They would run into the swamps and camp out there. And no white person could find them. And I don't know if any black person could have found them. And they would just live off the land out there for five, six, seven days, and then come back to the plantation. And this was a frequent practice. Um, I went up to Cambridge, Massachusetts to look through county, uh, the county library records. And I started reading newspapers from, um, you know, 1839, 1840, 50, and there, there would be ads for um, runaway slaves describing the slave and the people, I wrote down notes uh, for two of them because I kept reading them and not believing in myself. I just better write these down so I have them in my notes somewhere. But um, one of them was like, um, my Bessie, and they described Bessie, went to visit her sister in Baltimore, Maryland, and she hasn't come back. And I don't know why. <laughs> or, um, you know, just other ads where it was like, he's, he, he said he was going to go to the store and, and he went to the store and he brought the things and then I, and then I haven't seen him for seven days, you know, and it was just, it's like they, the slave owners did not always understand not why their slaves would want to escape. And it was so evident in how they worded their ads in the newspaper. It was, it was just incredible. Um, you know, you had the, most of them, the enslaved people were illiterate, but you had to carry passes. You, there was always the threat of, um, you know, someone grabbing up a free black and enslaving them again. Um, you were always confused about, you know, what you could do where you're, and, you know, for many slaves, their world was very small. It was just the plantation. But for many slaves, this Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, they were not, you know, big agricultural plantation where you need hundreds of, of slaves to, to work cotton or whatever. The, these were smaller plantations, slaves were skilled. Um, they were hired out to do various work. They worked the, the docks, they were boatmen, they were um, uh, uh, lumber, uh, timber, timbermen, and you know, they, went out into the world and, and interacted, which is with uh, the white world, which is how, uh, you know, Harriet knew all of these routes through rivers and uh, bogs and marshes and could handle, handle herself um, in several cities because uh, of the work that she had done while she was enslaved. So, um, it would be terribly, it would be terribly confusing. And I, and, and that's the world, I've forgotten what the uh, figures are of the number of people who um, were escaping from Maryland, but it, it was a problem for all of the slave owners, how many people they were losing uh, because Oh, uh, let's see. It was about 90 miles uh, to Philadelphia. And uh, it was easy for people to, to, not easy, but it was a short trip <laughs> for people to make their escapes. Um, no, no, it, I can't imagine what it would be like living there, uh, white for whites or blacks. Um, it, it was just, it would have been terribly confusing. And that's my perspective from present day. But you, you like to 
to know where you stand and you you like to know what your relationship is to to other people so in that sense you know cornelia polly's grandmother yes polly's grandmother uh being raised in the in the slave master's house um that that kind of thing happened at least as far south as as North Carolina. I don't know what it was like in Georgia or Mississippi or Alabama, um, but uh, at, at least in North Carolina, this book gives us an example of people really muddying the lines between uh, slave owning and accepting. You know, supposedly Mary Ruffin said, they're still my family. They're my nieces. They're, I own them, but they're still family. And she was not gonna let them be field hands. She just wasn't gonna do that. She raised them to be ladies. I, you know, it, it's insane. It's like crazy making or something for, for everybody in that kind of society. And it's slavery has just left a terrible legacy that we're still trying to shake off today. I don't know when we'll overcome it, but um, you know, we need to. So. That, that reminds me of um, the, the second question Dorothy sent partly talks about someone she had interviewed um, because she was saying what usually happened to children born to a white owner and an enslaved woman. You know, with, but she said, I, I once interviewed a man born in 1903 whose mother worked on a plantation and whose father was the son of the plantation owner. Mm -hmm. Sort of sounds like slavery hadn't ended, doesn't it? Uh, the couple never lived together, but had three children. The father had a nicer house built for them and he visited once in a while, but he was never truly a father to the individual I interviewed. But he would say things like, don't mess around too much, be serious in school and make something of yourself. So, you know, that would have been much later, but the, yeah, yeah, the carryover. Yeah. Um, it just depended on the status of the slave owner and um, and what he could get away with. <laughs> so, um it, it was the law that the uh, status of the child is determined by the status of the mother. So it, if a free black man married an enslaved woman, and that would have to be with permission of her, from her owner, any child that they had belonged to the owner of the mother. So, uh, and I, I thought, oh my goodness, Harriet Tubman married John Tubman, who was a free man. And he must have really loved her because any child they would have had would not have been his. Um, and that was the law. Um, and so a, a lot of the stories I've read about, uh, oh, just in doing Rosa Parks, her, her grandfather was the... Um, the son of a, a slave woman and his master. And uh, he, he was protected by his father. And, and till his father died, then the overseer beat him all the time, denied him food, overworked him. And, um, you know, Rosa Parks' grandfather, as a result, hated white people. He, you know, just, out and out hated them and was not afraid of them. He had so much anger that he was not afraid of them. After all, you know, he was half white, you know, but um, no, it's, and, and then you read and Pauli Murray in Proud Shoes, I think it is, where um, the people in the black community would see a light-skinned black person or a, a mulatto and call them this was never part of my life experience, but they would call them uh, uh, not dishonest. The, the, the black child would say, I'm honest and you, Pauli Murray, because you're mixed, you are dishonest. Whereas in the black 
culture that I grew up in Philadelphia, um, the, you know, it was preferred to be as white as possible. You know, oh, you have white hair or uh, you're light skinned or you could pass. Um, and certainly there were lots of people who did pass. Pauli Murray's Aunt Pauline could have passed for white. Uh, she married a man who was an attorney and could have passed for white and he could not get work. And so he, he said, I'm gonna pass, I'm sorry, we're gonna move. And, um, and, she, and Aunt Pauline would not. And so they divorced, she would not move, she would not pass for white. But that's, um, you know, you can be backed into that corner. I could pass for white, I, I'm, I'm educated, I can't find any work. So long, all oh, my black folks. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to pass for white and and just disappear into the white race. And that's not an unusual story. That you know, I think you can run into people today who um, say, "Well, we never heard they went away. We never heard from them again." Um, you know, because they decided to pass. Um, but it was against the law to, to marry, what, until 1977, um, you know, it was, it was against the law to marry, for a white person to marry anyone but another white person. And so, um, yes, it just persisted. And you need to remember that all of these enslaved people, um, it was security. You were going out into an unknown world. You, you didn't know how to read or write. Um, you didn't know anything except the people, you know, anyone except the people down the road <laughs> or, or whatever. Your world was so small and how terrifying it would be to suddenly be let loose. Some slave owners offered their, their uh, formerly, in, formerly enslaved people the option and a lot of them of staying on the plantation and a lot of them did it. Um, I went to visit a plantation just outside of uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And there was a black man there whose uh, family had been enslaved there for a long time. And his grandfather, and he learned his skills from his grandfather, his grandfather had, um, developed all the camellias that this plantation just had all of these gorgeous blooming I had never seen camellias before but but he was the one who had created them had um oh what's the word you know like breeding them but it was not breeding it was cutting them and putting them together the way you have to do apple trees or, or whatever and um and he could he's he when he was freed, his family stayed on the plantation. And this man, when I met him, is like in his 50s. And, um, and, and he was an employee, he got paid well, and he had his own home and family, but he was still working on that same plantation and still doing agricultural work, you know, creating species and things of flowers. And it, it was, they were just gorgeous gardens. I, it was the Garden Writers Association of America that was doing tours, and I got to to go on that tour. But um, no, it and it's it was just a big shift, and the South has not completely made that shift, as as we know. There's still a lot of um, oppression and and uh, bias, but for some owners and their enslaved people, the, the relationship changed, but the working together, working together, you know, there were many slaves in South, uh, plantations in South Carolina where it, to establish the plantation, the whites worked side by side in the field with the blacks until things were going well enough that they could make the money and, and build a plantation house and become upper class. But when they were starting off, when their families were starting off, they worked right next to the black people who 
who uh, helped make the plantation. It's just, I can't imagine what that society was like to live in. No. I'm not seeing other questions, but I'm curious, how did Polly Murray feel about what she was able to accomplish in, in her life to, to move past this? Yeah. Yeah. She was very satisfied. I thrilled. I almost said thrilled, but um, she spent all of her life. She was driven to defeat Jim Crow and she made great strides in that. Uh, it was her thinking that was the basis of the arguments that um, in front of the Supreme Court that brought us the Brown versus Board of Education to be the Kansas decision. Um, and, but she went to Howard Law to get her law degree and ran into um, sexism. So she became a feminist um, and she made inroads there, uh, you know, just the beginnings of legal arguments that uh, have proven to be the basis of how we argue for equal rights. And all of that came out of anger and frustration, I would say. But at a certain point in her life, she realized that um, we need more than law. You know, we, we need some, a spiritual change in this nation. And her church, the Episcopal church, the one she was raised in, the one her grandmother had to sit in the balcony because she was enslaved while Mary Ruffin Smith, her aunt sat down with the white folks. Um, her Episcopal church, uh, she pushed and pushed. She always opened her mouth. She always wrote letters. She challenged anyone on anything. Um, but finally, she, she realized that she needed to be within the church to help push it forward. And she went to seminary. And the Episcopal church decided finally while she was in seminary that they would indeed ordain women to be priests. And just in time for Polly Murray to finish seminary <laughs> and, and be ordained. And I think she really felt um, that that's where the battle was to bring people spiritually to a new, um, to a new way of, of relating to to other humans, fighting for human rights. So um, she, she had a, a more peaceful feel, you know, uh, to how, what she was writing and what she was preaching uh, before she died. But um, I think she's right. Uh, you know, Michelle Alexander is an attorney who wrote um, The New Jim Crow about how incarceration is a new kind of enslavement. And um, I went to hear her speak when she came to Asheville. And no, actually she didn't speak. She just took questions. And finally someone asked her what she was doing now. And she said, I'm in seminary now. And I just went, that's just like the route Polly Murray took, you know, law and writing and protesting and and Michelle Alexander I don't know what she's doing at this moment because it was a few years ago but uh she said what we need in this nation is a spiritual shift and I I don't think the solution is in the laws and Polly Murray thought that the laws were there and certainly not all the laws are there but enough of the law is there to, to make for change, but we haven't changed. We haven't fulfilled the law. And that is, at least Michelle Alexander would agree, that is a spiritual failing on our part. And that's what we need to, to work on and work from, the spiritual change. So, um, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there are other activists who come to that conclusion as well. It's just like beating your head against a wall, this, you know, until um, people understand that it's the human race. You know, we'll see if we'll get there. 
I I don't know. Um, I don't know. Very often people come to me and say, um, you know, where's the next leader? Where's the next Martin Luther King Jr. or whatever? And um, and you know, it I don't think it it needs to be one leader anymore, a spokesperson for a whole race. Um, it needs to be truly grassroots and spiritual. And it, in many ways, it needs to be white led, you know, that white leaders have to bring white Americans to a new place. It's not, you know, my job as an African American. But as an African American, I can certainly enter into dialogue, share my experience, my feelings. Um, and as, an, as African-Americans, we need to, to look at the kinds of biases that, and uh, the things that we've brought along with us from enslavement that are, are limiting us. And, and one thing that I, is really dismaying for me is um, the loss of the passion for an education and seeing education as uh, the best tool for all of us. I mean, all of us can get an education. All of us need an education. And I don't know how to, um, to change that is certainly when when you read the stories in Proud Shoes and in other sources of how far people would walk, the sacrifices they would make to send their children to school, uh, the the threats that they uh, you know endured just to get an education, it it, it was a passion and um, and I. I just don't know how, how we lost that. But I think education is a, a key to our success as African-Americans. And we need to provide it for each other and seek it out ourselves. And just, it seems to be a lost art, <laughs> you know, so. Oh, thank you, Becky. I mean, it. I think that's part of Ash and Chautauqua's, you know, the heart of what we're doing is trying to bring these stories and and education to people in in different ways. So um, I love how you have brought this kind of to a really hopeful, uplifting ending, I think. Um, yeah. And I was going to ask about why an Episcopal priest so late in life, but you answered that question. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. No, and, and that's what I love about Chautauqua is that it's a chance for dialogue and interaction about things that people are often uncomfortable talking about, but it's a safe place for us to come together. And it doesn't feel manipulative like these programs on building race relations or, you know, discovering your racist feelings and getting rid of them or whatever. There are all kinds of, of programs like that now. That, um, But I, I think it's just going to be one-to-one -one and making friends and listening to each other and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add also that the Maltz Museum up in Cleveland has the, uh -huh. the civil, civil rights exhibit now. Um, Carolyn and I went and... and um, I I could be confused, but I think that Pauli Murray was actually included in that. But oh. it might have been Dorothy in the um, when they did the exhibit on RBG. I, I'm getting them two of them mixed up. But they but that museum that's there for any of you that are close by. You know, it's a very great exhibit. In fact, it was there I think in 2017, and then they brought it back. Um, you're obviously you said you're is it specific to Cleveland or Ohio because I'm I'm going to a lot of exhibits that are just about what black life was like in in Buncombe County uh, which is my county in North Carolina and it's just great to 
to say, yes, we were there, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter whether we were great or not, because most people are not great or fabulous leaders, but we were there and it's being recognized. So was this exhibit in Cleveland specific to Ohio or Cleveland or? No, no, no. It's more about like it, there's um, shows the March on Washington and, and how people were jailed mm -hmm. and so forth. Ida B. Wells is part of it. Oh, yeah. Know. Carolyn, do you remember? Oh, yeah, I, would, I was going to add that. Um, pleasant things. The, the draw is that the photographers, the draw is the photographers right. who just happened to be the ones who told the story in, in photographs. So they, had, they were at major events with Fannie Lou Hamer in the uh, Democratic Convention. Oh my goodness, 68. They went, oh, they're, they're, they're brought up on the wall. The Moss Museum is wonderful. If you come to Cleveland, you gotta go. Uh, and um, other uh, photos, they have a signs, reproduce the signs that both sides of the protest lines held. Um, Martin Luther King, his wife in her bedroom with Dr. Abernathy. So it's the treasures that the photographers capture. Right, just, and images just, are so powerful. You don't forget something. Yeah, the stories in the photographs. That sounds like a great exhibit. I would come to Cleveland and see. I think uh, it'll be there growth through February. I, I think through this know, month. but I could look it up on the phone. Yeah, well, you can <laughs> go Google Moss Museum of Malt Jewish Museum. Heritage. Moss Museum, right, uh, of tolerance. And I just wanted to add a quick word about spiritual aspect. Uh, I'm I'm Baptist, Jews, <laughs> Ruth is Jewish, and we talked together. We talked together for years. We were and office mates. That's true. When we started, we were in the same office. Right. We were office mates. Uh, we go way back. Anyway, my point is that yes, the early abolitionists were Christian leaders. When you go back, the abolitionists were leaders, faith-based leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're getting at, Becky. It hasn't changed. It has to be the faith-based leaders on both yeah. sides. Yeah. Who step up. And I think we are. We, we are where we were right. when we look at leadership. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think well, I grew up in Philadelphia and of course, uh, you know, I think far too many people think that it was just the Quakers, but it was not, you know, Philadelphia is a Quaker city, but, um, you know, it was not just the Quakers and um, yeah, no, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, there are a lot of different Baptist groups. And the friends, yeah. Well, in Paulie in Pauli Murray's autobiography, she talks about the first book I think she published was with the help of the Methodists. The Methodists. Yeah. Yes. That's she codified book. all of the race laws. And, you know, she's so thorough. I think those uh, Methodist women just wanted a simple listing of the, of the laws. And two years later, Pauli Murray has this huge book that covered all race laws, positive ones, negative ones in all of the states. And, um, you know, she was one for detail and being thorough. And it, it made a difference. It was the Bible for the civil rights attorneys uh, up until, you know, the Brown v. Board of Education decision 54. But yeah, no, she was amazing. And we're all amazing, really. Look, we've all survived. We've made friendships, we've made changes in our own hearts and so we live and learn every day it's wonderful that's true yeah um. well i don't see any more questions i do see um um alan anderson our our web guru he's wonderful um said a point of clarification on Michelle Alexander that she was a visiting professor of social justice at Union Theological Seminary in New York, but he's not sure she actually was in was the studying so, there. Yeah. Well, That's interesting. We, yes, we you can all go look into that. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, memory. So. Oh, and I and I was thinking, oh, I wish this moss museum would be still the exhibit would still be here in the summer, and we would take you up there. But it sounds like it may not. It's yeah. Be there that long. That's right. too bad. But for the rest of you who are here tonight, if you can be in Ashland this summer, July 11th through the 15th, uh, Becky will be, let's see, I think you are going to be Wednesday night of that week. And so okay. um, you can hear Polly Murray tell these stories or other stories um, of her life. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all for coming. Becky, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, but also always your heart, because, you know, you can tell you are passionate about the characters you portray. And and I know you need to be to put this much work in, but I love hearing, I, I love watching you kind of light up when you talk about the characters you portray. Um, and And it just, it always feels like it comes from the heart. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we have two more book talks. March 23rd, Joey Medea will be talking about um, the world of pirates. So we're really shifting gears. Uh, but Samuel Bellamy was a pirate. And so we're going to, the book covers many, many pirates, uh, but Bellamy's one of them. And then uh, Larry Bounds, who's with us here tonight, um, will be talking about Harry Houdini. So again, we have history's real life action figures all across the gamut in this troupe. Um, so I hope you can come back for those two events. I hope you can come to Ashland July 11th through the 15th to hear all of the scholars in their performances. And when you leave tonight, there will be a little survey if you can fill it out or stars putting the link in uh, the chat as well. This helps us gather data um, to, to assess how we're doing and, and how we can do it better. So we appreciate your help on that. Thank you again, Becky. It's been a oh, wonderful It's been a pleasure. Week. Thank you. Yes. yes. Good luck with the rest of your tour at, in Colorado. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. <laughs> It'll be great. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. Good night.